I want to start where we left off by looking at the basic monopoly case that you should have in your notes and you also should know for the final exam. So draw a downward sloping demand curve. That one little trick to draw the marginal revenue curve is to take the midpoint where the demand curve would intersect the horizontal axis. That kind of helps as a little cheater spot there to draw the marginal revenue curve. The marginal revenue curve does technically go below the line because it can be negative. And draw some marginal cost curve that shows the law of diminishing marginal product. It's upward sloping. And Shane, number between four and eight. Seven. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Austin, how does a firm maximize profits? Uh, close. Jake, how does a firm maximize profits? Cameron, how does a firm maximize profits? Awesome. Jake, how does a firm maximize profits? Cameron, how does a firm maximize profits? Nice and loud. Awesome. Jake, how does firm maximize profits? Nice. Austin, how does firm maximize profits? Jake, how does a firm maximize profits? Austin, how does a firm maximize profits? Jake, how does a firm maximize profits? That's good. Austin, how does a firm maximize profits? Revenue generated equals. No, Jake, how does firm maximize profits? Austin. Now, Austin, I just want to point out that what you said at first was kind of close, but you missed that very first opener that Cameron and Jake finally got to by producing the quantity where that MR equals MC or whatever you said, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So that is the thing that's got to stick in your head is that you're, you're choosing the profit maximizing quantity by looking at the revenue and the cost of each incremental unit. All right, so the monopolist produces QM, and we learned last time that they're going to charge the highest price people are willing and able to pay for that quantity of goods, which is given to us by the demand curve. So we go up to the demand curve because it conveys that information. We hang a left, and that is the price that the monopolist will charge. So that gives us our revenue information. And to calculate profit, we need also the cost, average total cost. So we drew this in last time. And we kind of paid special attention to where the marginal cost intersects the average total cost curve because it's at the minimum point. The reason I'm being so picky about that is that it identifies the productively efficient point for society. So our idea here is that if we turn to the free marketplace to solve society's problems, what problems? Well, the big economic problem. How do we satisfy unlimited wants with limited resources? We only have a certain amount of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship on our island. The big problem is how do we satisfy the unlimited wants of people on our island? The market system may at times lead to a company behaving like this. 
when that happens, it's a problem. We're not being, we're not getting the results from the market system that we'd want to get. All right, so we see those problems here graphically by knowing that the quantity that the profit maximizer is going to make is this amount. Society's allocatively efficient quantity is over here, where Deidre pointed out marginal cost and marginal benefit equal each other here. So this is the allocatively efficient quantity we identified last time. The point here is that the market cranks out this. This is what society wants to have. We're not getting the result we want. The market is failing us in a sense. It's failing to provide society's correct answer, so to speak, to maximize social welfare. All right, and then we also identified this point because that is the quantity that's productively efficient. The point is that the monopolist doesn't get either of these. All right, we talked about deadweight loss last time. Who brought us deadweight loss? Who gave us deadweight loss? When did we get a deadweight loss in our system in chapter six? Give me an example of where a deadweight loss was created. Okay, the number, the number produced was off due to what reason? What government intervention possibly gave us a deadweight loss? Taxes. Taxes, subsidies. In fact, all of those government interventions caused the quantity to fall off of what was ideal. And that was what created a deadweight loss. Well, here we have a similar thing going on. There's a deadweight loss to society by having a monopoly producing this good. There's not enough of it being produced. And similar to what we had with the tax, we can identify that loss in social welfare with the difference between what's allocatively efficient and what the monopoly is producing and the current pricing system and what's going on. This area here represents the difference between the marginal benefits people could be getting and what they're not getting because a monopoly is underproducing the good. So this is the deadweight loss to a monopoly. So a loss in social welfare to a monopoly. So our answer to that problem is to not allow monopolies in the market economy. Our, we have laws on the books called antitrust laws that try to keep people from acquiring a monopoly. All right, questions on that? Now, I want to give you a different situation where it might be most efficient to have one producer. So it's kind of an oddball case called a natural monopoly. So a natural monopoly occurs when the industry is such that there's economies of scale over all relevant ranges of production. Oh boy, there's another term we learned a while back. I think you need to know it, you need to, to know it for exam number three. Economies of scale. What was the gist of that concept? Economies of scale. Okay, as output goes up, as the company increases the scale of production, a large number of units, they enjoy a decrease in cost, right? So their costs fall. So it's kind of the big volume type, the Walmart idea. The bigger they are, the more they produce, the more they sell, the lower their costs are to the consumers because they can make it up in volume. That's the economist's notion of economies of scale, that volume discount concept even though it's slightly different. So a natural monopoly occurs, it occurs when 
uh, there are economies of scale, economies of scale over all relevant ranges of production. <laughs> And so our real shorthand notation that we needed to know for economies of scale was that an increase in quantity led to a decrease in long run average total cost. Long run average total cost. We're gonna draw a picture of what that looked like in a moment here, but increase the scale of production, average costs fall. So over all ranges of production, imagine we're producing electricity. Uh, my neighbor works at the nuclear power plant. I can't remember if I've told you that, guys that. And so I've learned a little bit about nuclear power. And their plant kicks out enough energy to power all of Kansas City all by itself. We don't need any coal or anything. So nuclear power from that plant, which is about 40 minutes uh, southwest of Ottawa kicks out enough energy to power all of Kansas City basically. It's just crazy what nuclear power can do. Now, uh, that means that the more and more quantity we use those fixed facilities, you got a huge plant, right? A lot of hazards potentially that we need to deal with over time, although it's a lot safer than most people think. But the more we can produce the lower is the average cost per unit. So the average total cost for producing electricity might look like this. So this would be the average total cost curve. Now that's not U-shaped like we had been doing before. Although it might be, but over the relevant ranges like powering all of Kansas City, like we almost don't need much more, this little graph might be bowl-shaped, but it looks like this. Just like what we did before. There's the nice bowl-shaped look. But over all relevant ranges of production, it's downward sloping. If the average total cost curve looks like that, the marginal cost curve does the same properties as it did before when my semester GPA was below the average, the average was falling, right? So my marginal cost curve looks something like this. And it too, so this is my marginal cost curve, still has the same properties. If we were to extend it this way, it would cut through the dash line and the marginal cost curve would look like this. So we're just kind of taking a snapshot of the relevant ranges of production. All right, so with a natural monopoly, it's not really efficient to have one or two, or, I'm sorry, two or three or four or five <laughs> companies competing for the market share. Because if we start to split up the market, if ultimately Kansas City needs a thousand gigawatts of whatever this gigawatt number is, right? It doesn't make sense to have two companies in the market splitting it 50-50. Because imagine if, if, each co if there was two companies splitting up the 1,000 gigawatts here, they would both have to operate at a higher level because they're not able to take advantage of one being there using the economies of scale. So it turns out to be better, potentially, to have one company providing electricity rather than two or three or four. We're taking advantage of the economies of scale. All right, so the next thing I want to look at is the implications on demand and marginal revenue and what this company is going to do. So let's uh, draw a demand curve. 
downward sloping, just like what we had on the previous graph. Draw a marginal revenue curve, twice as steep cutting through the midpoint. Let's see, where did we leave off with? Cameron, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Curtis, how does a firm, how does this power, nuclear power plant maximize profits? All right, produce the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit. See how we're using that each time. It doesn't matter if we're the photography shop out of our basement or if we're the nuclear power plant. The Profit maximizing quantity is always where the revenue generated by the last gigawatt is equal to the cost of the last gigawatt. And we're going to charge the highest price people are willing and able to pay for that quantity of production. And so this is the price that the monopolist is going to charge. So maybe this is uh, $30 per gigawatt. I'm not going to totally shade in the graph this time, but the mechanics are the same as we did last time. At this quantity, the average cost per gigawatt, we go up to the average total cost curve, hang a left, there's the average total cost. That means that the nuclear power plant is making this much profit. So all those mechanics remain. All right. The dead weight loss is still going on that we saw before. Where is the allocatively efficient quantity that society would like to see of electricity? Where does that quantity occur? Where does that occur? Allocative efficiency. What two things were what two things are intersecting were at the quantity at the allocatively efficient quantity? What two curves? Marginal cost and demand. Marginal cost and demand. Good. Why demand? Why demand? Not necessarily Logan. What is the demand curve always equal to? The marginal. Marginal, not revenue. Not product, benefit. So it shows the benefit that you get as a consumer for consuming electricity through the price you're willing to pay. Why? Because you wouldn't have bought it otherwise. So we assume that you're at least getting $30 worth of benefit for that unit of electricity you consume because you bought it. You may be getting $40 worth of benefit and therefore you're enjoying what? If you paid less than what the benefit was that you were getting. Consumer surplus, right? That was the deal. So notice we still have that consumer surplus concept going on. Here's the demand curve. If we picked out this gigawatt at, uh, I don't know, 133, the 133rd gigawatt, somebody out there was willing to pay a lot more than what they had to pay, they enjoyed some consumer surplus. All right, so demand is the marginal benefit curve, and society's allocatively efficient quantity is right here. All right, so we got these trade-offs of thinking about the problem with the market. The monopolist is producing down here, society wants to be up here. There's an underproduction of electricity because of the monopoly, one firm. What are some things we could do with maybe some government intervention to help correct the problem? What are some things the government might look to do to help correct the problem, this underproduction problem. 
um, we wouldn't need to give them a subsidy. What? Let's think about the problem. We've got two left. Well, um, I guess I take that back, Brian. That when we subsidize activities, it does <coughs> encourage production. So I think I need to give you an extra credit point on that. So you, you get, I don't know if that's what exactly you meant, but but how? Let me think politically here for a second. How does that sound? Where? The nuclear power plant is making a bunch of money, and now we're going to give you more money. Not so hot, right? Not going to fly politically. Although you're on to the to the right concept, it just might not be the the best way to hit it. Um, in general, relative to the allocatively efficient point, are prices too high or too low? Too high. So what might the government do to might try to get that price lower through a ceiling, right? So what if the government came in and said, well, geez, $30, that's way too high. We should have it lower. That might be one policy instrument to do. Um, <clears throat> what if the government just said, hey, I want you to produce this quantity. So this is at, uh, let's see, according to my scale, 1,200 gigawatts. All right, nuclear power plant, you have to produce 1,200 gigawatts. I have estimated that. What's wrong by the government forcing the nuclear power plant to make 1,200 units? There's something kind of wrong here. What's going on at 1,200? Let me add a little bit more information. The price that people, we're still having consumers just buy this, remember, at 1,200 gigawatts, people are using up a lot of electricity because it's so cheap. They're able to buy electricity at, uh, let's see, that's 15, looks like five bucks, right? In order to dump all the gigawatts of power, the market is only willing to pay five bucks. So. You can imagine that uh, we just got extra things plugged in, we leave the lights on, and it's like, oh, geez, electricity's so cheap. I love it, you know, so 1200 If this is the price that the company is getting, what's going on with profit at a production level of 1200 They're not, there's not, they're not only not maximizing profit, what are they doing, what's going on? There's a losing money, good. There's a loss here. So at $1,200, the average total cost per gigawatt <laughs> is higher than the price that people would be paying. They are losing money. Can the government force this company to provide this product and lose money? Can the government force this company to produce this quantity because it's good for society and lose money. No. God bless America. We're not there yet, right? So the government cannot force a company to do that. What do they do instead? They own the company. They take it over. So that happens in some cases too. Is this turn into a government run business? But that has issues as well. All right, so at the allocatively efficient quantity, the producer wouldn't produce on a voluntary basis because they're losing money. So that doesn't work. So what's another approach that the government could take if it desires to keep production in the private sector, not take it on themselves? What other sort of policy could they implement to get us closer to this quantity. What other thing could they do that might work? Where does the firm break even? Where does this company break even? Where what intersects what? if we were to look at a wide variety of quantities, where would they 
break even. In other words, economic profits equal to zero, but they're earning a normal profit, as we've learned in the previous chapter. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost? No. Because, and, and let me just reiterate that, Shane. The, uh, at this quantity, uh, marginal revenue equals marginal cost here, and they were still earning that profit. So I want to squeeze that profit out. What quantity, if we were to pick a new quantity here, where does profits equal zero? 1,000, okay, why? What, what's intersecting at 1,000 or what's going on? Demand and average total cost, good. All right, and I didn't, they don't perfectly line up here, but uh, I thought that's where you were going with that. So I didn't mean for that 1,000 to be right on, right on the money. In fact, I'm just gonna go ahead and erase this 1,000 for now. You guys can keep it there if you got it, but all I wanna do is think about this quantity right here. At this quantity, let's call it QG, G for government, government regulation. At this quantity, the firm is earning zero profit because price equals average total cost. So this is the type of approach that the government often takes with a natural monopoly, is to force profits to be zero. It's not like we don't want you to make money, but we only want you to earn a fair amount of money. So we're gonna regulate you and watch you, and you have to prove it to us that you're just earning a fair return. So we look at, we talked about when we opened up the discussion of monopolies, uh, electricity and gas and some of the utility services, we only have one company to pick, right? Well, that company, like here it's the city of Ottawa, they are monitored to make sure that they're not uh, earning any economic profits, that they're not abusing it. So they kind of have the government over their shoulder. All right, questions or comments on that? Um, Economists refer to this as a second best solution. The first best solution would be getting somehow to the allocatively efficient quantity. The monopoly left alone is too low. So this kind of gets us a little closer. See how G is kind of close to here, but we're not quite there. Second best solution. All right, so. Um, Let's put conclusions from natural monopoly. <clears throat> so number one, the same result we got with a regular monopoly is that the quantity that the monopolist produces is less than what's allocatively efficient. So <coughs> under production. So number two, because of economies of scale, it's potentially the best to have one firm produce it because cost would be the lowest, allowing just one firm to produce it. So uh, average total cost is small as possible by having one firm produce all quantity due to economies of scale. Three. The government cannot force monopoly to produce the allocatively efficient quantity, QAE, because at that quantity, 
at QAE, the monopoly incurs a loss. So this is the old God bless America. Government cannot force the private company to produce this amount because it incurs a loss. Uh, so number four, <clears throat> number four is that a second best solution is to uh, impose a zero profit policy. So government regulated monopoly, a government regulated monopoly. And what's going on there is that price equals average total cost, which means economic profits are zero. You're just earning a normal profit. And so, you guys want to add one last thing here. They are having them, production is at QG. Our second best solution, maybe. All right, so that sounds kind of nice. We can have the government watch the company to make sure they're not earning any unfair profits. Does anybody see any problems with that? What are some potential issues that might come up? So imagine our company, our nuclear power plant, needs a company car. Do you go out and buy the Cadillac or the Chevy Cavalier? Which one would you rather drive, the Cadillac or the Cavalier? Caddy. You need a new desk for your office. Do you go out and buy the nice oak desk or do you go run to Walmart and buy the particle board desk? The oak, right? You need to have some new pens and pencils. Do you buy the nice quality fountain pens or the junky gummy ones that you get in a hundred pack? You might buy some nicer writing utensils. All right, where am I going with this? That if the government forces profits to be zero, it might be possible for the company to have some costs that aren't what they would be under a competitive environment, right? There's no incentive for them to be cost minimizers anymore because they just have profits equal to zero. So if we look at the profit equation, total revenue minus total cost, the government has said this has got to be zero. You don't have pricing power, but you're just going to turn in your receipts and have costs. Now, how does that look graphically? I still got to get my golf clubs going, so we have to use my fat line of my umbrella here. Um, if this is the average total cost curve, and we have that behavior going on of the oak desk, the Cadillac, the nice pens, the nice office space. What happens to this average total cost curve? It goes up, right? It shifts up. The cost of production are shifting up. Now, I guess I don't really need a perfect straight line anyway since I kind of got a curve. As this curve starts to drift up, what happens to QG? Does it go up or down? 
it goes down, right? As this starts to shift up, that equilibrium point is drifting this way. In fact, if we abuse the system enough, it might be possible to drive QG equal to QM. You got it. Right? So that is kind of working the system. That opens up possibilities with the government stepping in, that it's not the cure-all thing to have the government step in and say, okay, I got an idea. How about if we just say profits are equal to zero? We might start to see that type of behavior because that's what we should expect. The business is still a business at the end of the day. They didn't all of a sudden turn into a charity. They're there to maximize profits, which the government said you can't do. So they said, oh, okay, well, I got a clever idea. Let's make this be a little higher than maybe it would be under a competitive environment. All right, so that's one last issue. Any comments on that? We'll put that as comment number five here. All right, so number five. Issue number five might be that uh, the firm has incentive, let me change the wording on that. The firm has no incentive to minimize cost. So we're going to choose the caddy over the cavalier. We're going to choose the oak desk over the particle board desk. The firm has no incentive to minimize costs. And therefore, we expect an increase in average total cost, a shift up. And that's going to result in QG decreasing. <clears throat> so QG will decrease heading towards what we were trying to avoid in the beginning, heading towards what the monopoly might have produced anyway, QM. So this is one form of government failure. We maybe chose a policy that didn't get the results we were intending because we didn't think through all of that. Maybe we need to reevaluate and look at something different. So this is a form of government failure. Yes, it's true that the government does not have all the answers for us. It's possible that they can fail. We said the market's not bringing the right result. It's not government to the rescue always. There might need to look at that a little harder. <clears throat> okay, questions or comments there? All right, so that's our natural monopoly. Um, The next topic I want to pick up on where we left off was price discrimination. So we defined it last time as a situation where the company is charging different prices to different consumers for the same product. Senior copy, since my parents are in here, they can get a copy cheaper than you guys can at McDonald's, and that just doesn't seem fair, right? Senior copy. That's price discrimination, it's completely legal. And I wanna see how, what the impacts of that are uh, graphically and see what the results are from firms doing that. 
All right, so I'm going to draw the back to the traditional monopoly graph here. So we'll draw the four curves up here, marginal revenue, marginal cost, demand, and average total cost, same thing we did before. <clears throat> Mark down the quantity that we'd expect the profit maximizer to make, which is right here, where the marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We charge the highest price people are willing and able to pay. Bango, bango, bongo. We've got some profits being made. area surplus. surplus consumer surplus so just want a little reminder here that even with a monopoly there's some people that are getting a deal so there's still people out there not bothered by the fact that a monopoly is out there maybe because they're willing to pay more anyway so there's still some consumer surplus uh, being enjoyed by the consumers now the producers would love to try to capture some of that. They know, because they're pretty smart at what they do, that there's people out there willing to pay more for it. So they would love to try to segment the market. And if we think of the monopolist making 100 units, the first 50 units, if we were to order people by their willingness to pay, somebody out there was willing to pay this amount. So if this product was a, um, oh, let's call it a $12 haircut. The monopolist, so there's only one hair shop in Ottawa, and they are currently charging $12 for a haircut. But they know that there's a few people in Ottawa that are willing to pay more than that. They might be willing to pay $14. If they can successfully figure out who those people are and get them to pay more money, they will kind of take away what they would have been willing to pay anyway and it'll go to the company. So for those first 50 people, somebody out there, even though they're paying $14, they were willing to pay $16. So they're still getting some consumer surplus. But they're getting charged 14. And so what we've done is brought that little area that used to be the consumers back to the producer. It's profit now. Some consumers are still paying the cheap price, the student price maybe, of $12 a haircut, and other people are paying $14. And so that's the idea of um, price discrimination and why companies do that to you guys. But you need to know the three things for the exam, three, re three ways that they can pull that off. They need to have different consumers with different willingness to pay students versus non-students maybe no resale possibilities right so we got to have that in place in order to pull it off and you got to be able to separate them out legally student IDs or something else all right what happens from society standpoint though what if we were able to perfectly price discriminate I want to push your brains a little bit here I gave you an example where there's two prices 14 and 12. But imagine I was able to charge a different price for every unit. So the person who was willing to pay $24, I charge $24. The person who was willing, who got the 100th haircut that was only willing to pay 12, I charged them 12. The person who got the 99th haircut 
I charge them $12.05. What if I was to perfectly price discriminate? If I did that, then the revenue generated off of the 50th haircut would be $14. The revenue generated off the 99th haircut, the revenue now, off the 99th haircut would be $12.05. The revenue generated off the 75th haircut is equal to the price that I'm charging that person. With perfect price discrimination, the demand curve is the marginal revenue curve, just like what we saw in perfect competition. So, Make sure you highlight this good, because this is different than what we talked about before. Here's the single price monopoly. Here's the perfect price discrimination situation. So perfect price discrimination is kind of an extreme case. Perfect price discrimination, kind of an extreme case. But look at the implications for allocative efficiency. All firms maximize profits by producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is equal to the cost of the last unit. If the company can dis price discriminate, that occurs right here. The quantity that the perfectly price discriminating monopolist is going to produce is right here, which actually happens to be what type of efficient quantity? Allocative. So this is the allocatively efficient solution. So this is going to sound a little bizarre, but by having the company be able to take advantage of you a little bit, I, I hate to even use those words because they're really in some ways not, did any consumer really get screwed? This person was willing to pay $14. How much did they pay? $14. This person was willing to pay $12.05. How much did they pay? $12.05. Did they get screwed? No, it was still a voluntary transaction. As the company is able to do some price discrimination, the marginal revenue curve in the single price case starts to drift this way. In the perfect case, it's equal to it. But if it's somewhere in between, it's in between here. And if it is here, we have more quantity than where we were in the single price case. So an argument can be made that this is good for society. We're getting more of the product exchanged by having price discrimination. So it's not all bad even though it's got a nasty word to it. We always have discrimination as kind of a, a negative term in general. But in this case, maybe there's some, some merit to it. All right, we'll pick up there on Friday.